Hello, and welcome again to the Let's Do a Crime podcast. I'm Ryan, he, him. And I'm Mouse, they, them. I have been in emergency service and public safety, including law enforcement, for over 10 years, but I am not a police officer. And I'm an artist that works predominantly in wet media, such as watercolor and ink. And I have finally entered my last year at art school. Yay! You're going to get an actual degree. I'm going to get that degree. <laughs> so, Mouse, today Ryan. I have a special drink for the show. Ooh. I'm drinking a German white wine, uh, Dr. Zen Zen Cabinet Pratis Katz wine. Any okay. ideas why that might be? Because you like wine? Well, here's a hint that you, maybe you'll get. Uh, I couldn't find an Austrian wine. <gasps> oh. Okay, yeah, I know what we're talking about. <laughs> so in June 27th, 1985, a bottle mm -hmm. of wine from a market in Stuttgart is analyzed in a lab and confirmed to contain di uh, diethylene glycol. A toxic chemical that made the wine sweeter. This is not right. an isolated incident. Uh, glycol contamination will soon be found to be very rampant in the industry. Jesus Christ. So you, you know what we're talking about. We're talking about the Austrian wine poisoning scandal. Yeah, yes I do. And I also know that uh, the glycol and also like antifreeze and stuff is very dangerous because it tastes really sweet. So, yep. of course people wouldn't have noticed. So, trigger warnings, there's this one's a light one. There's not really a whole lot of trigger stuff in here, but it does involve mm -hmm. poisoning and alcohol, so those things. Mm hmm I don't think anyone dies, though, question mark? Uh, no. The minor okay. spoiler, they, they did report someone died, but no one actually is confirmed to have died. Okay. I mean, that's good. I don't... We don't want anyone to have died. So, do you know much about wine production? Uh... <laughs> No. <laughs> I know that, like, it, you take grape, and you crush it, and then you store it until it uh, it turns into wine. <laughs> More or less. So, with wine production, I'm not going to go super into it, because that's a huge topic in of itself. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the basic thing is, you take you take grapes, you crush them, you, you mix them with, with a the yeast, it ferments, you end up get, getting wine. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different types of wine based on the kind of grape and the kind of techniques you use. Mm -hmm. they, they vary in sweetness, like dry wines are, like don't have a whole lot of sugar in them, so they're not very sweet. Sweet wines still have some sugar in them, so they're more sweet. Like, like Moscato is a very sweet wine that most people know about because it's pretty common. It's the only wine that I like <laughs> because it's sweet. You would actually probably like Pratikot's wine because it's, it's sweet wine as well. Oh, interesting. So, which is important to this topic, mm -hmm. uh, so when you leave grapes on the vine for a long period of time, they can become mm -hmm. sweeter, especially if they get a certain kind of infection called noble rot, which uh, causes it to have certain sugars that aren't as fermentable, which results in sweeter wine. Okay. So, this type of wine is very popular, at least uh, at least in this period of time, in Germany. Mm -hmm. So, in the 70s, Austria had a very booming wine market. Favorable, uh, favorable conditions allowed them to produce large quantities of high-quality sweet Pratikots wine. So much so that many producers were given contracts to provide Pratikots wine to German store chains. However, the early 80s had several unfavorable growing years. 1982 specifically had a very high output of sour, low-quality wine, uh. yeah, putting the contracts in jeopardy. However, this output of sweet wine soon bounced back, even in less than ideal conditions, Making some of the industry suspicious. I mean, yeah, if there's, like, a problem with wine production that leads to, like, large quantities of wine not tasting right, I guess I also would be a little suspicious if, like, suddenly they were, like, back to normal. Yeah, and, like, one of the things that, like, you wouldn't think would be unfavorable but was the case in this is having too much rain because mm -hmm. that'll cause the, grain, the, the grapes to fatten and become big and juicy too quickly, which means they won't have time to sweeten on the vine. Which wow. is, you know, that makes sense, though. So so you have to harvest them earlier, which means mm -hmm. that either your output's going to go down or you have to put up with these less flavorful grapes. And also, like, you can't use every kind of grape for wine. Like, there's specific kind of grapes that work really well for wine and there's some that don't. 
Like mm-hmm. like your typical grapes you find at the grocery store probably wouldn't make great wine, just they don't have the right properties. And that's why Joe Schmo at the grocery store is allowed to eat them. Yep. So, and also, like, they're a lot easier to grow. So Well, I mean, uh, it's so many people like grapes. I can understand why they would have, like, oh, is this why people are, like, so hoity-toity about, like, like wine vineyards? Yeah, because uh, when you have, a like, wine vineyards, it will grow certain types of grapes, depending on the kind of, kind of wine they're, they're growing. Mm-hmm. But also, like... Like there, there's a lot of mythology in in winemaking about, like oh this 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 earth has this kind of properties and blah blah blah, like that's kind of all bullshit. It's all about nutrients versus climate versus grape the the, the genetic strain of the grape. Mm-hmm. So obviously some areas have better soil and better uh, seasonal conditions. So you're yeah. gonna get better quality grapes out of it, and certain types of grapes will grow better there. And so like yeah, the, the type of grape and how well it's been grown and what soil it's grown in has, does have a huge effect on the final result of the wine which is mm-hmm. why people are pretty hoity-toity about it this is opposed okay. to things like uh like beers or spirits where there, there's there's ways to fix it part way through if if, if your starting conditions aren't super favorable because like mm-hmm. with beer there's a lot more steps to the process of making it so you have a lot uh, like a uh, like professional like beer masters brew masters will actually like taste it at every step of the process even though it tastes disgusting because it'll tell them like what's wrong at this step and they can correct it and so beer can kind of be fixed that way okay and of course, spirits if you just distill them down and get the pure alcohol out it doesn't really matter what was in it before mm-hmm. but wine doesn't really work like that so that's why people are so like um snobbish about like certain certain vintages and stuff like that because certain growing years would have better wine and stuff like that okay yeah no this all makes sense which brings us to additives. Okay. So there are tons of safe ways to imp- improve the sweetness and body of a wine. Um, I brew mead as one of my hobbies, and this, this is a common thing in mead making is back sweetening and adding things after the brew is done to change the flavor. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can buy pre-mixed sugars called wine conditioners at grocery stores. That's really common in hobbyists. Uh, I add straight honey to my mead after fermentation completes to add some sweetness back in. Or you can blend several wines together to balance them out. Uh, but like any food product, you have to disclose what you put into it. And in the wine mm-hmm. industry, artificially improved wine is considered to be low quality and that's is so worth substantially less. There is a lot of snobbishness about this. Yeah, that's so dumb. Like, who fucking cares if you like add something to the wine to make it taste better? Yeah, so like a lot of the really good cheap wines you can buy in stores are blends. Mm-hmm. This, uh, this is an obvious solution to the problem. But it won't fulfill the contracts the Austrian vineyards had signed into. So especially mm-hmm. at the time, blended or modified wines were looked down upon, and that just wouldn't be acceptable for their contracts. So this is kind of like a catch-22 situation for them. Yeah, I get it, but I don't know. I'm a big fan <laughs> of my like t- $10 barefoot Moscato, which probably has a blend in it. Like, yeah, it I- doesn't matter. I agree. If you read the label, it'll say wine blend on it. And I mean, mm-hmm. I, will, I will say like of Barefoot specifically, some of their best wines are blends. Like the, the different flavors of Moscato are usually blends between a regular Moscato wine and like either a juice or a wine made with different different fruit. Oh, if it had juice in it, that would also definitely explain why I like it so much. Because notoriously, I do not like bitter drinks or drinks that taste very alcoholic. Yeah, so... They, that's part of the reason why those are considered like cheap, low quality, even though they're quite good. It's mm-hmm. it's uh it's just because of the fact they have some food science done to them, and they aren't pure. But like, if you're trying to enjoy yourself, who cares, right? Yeah. So wine fraud was already a thing before this. Most mm-hmm. wine fraud, though, is just like misrepresenting uh, the wine, not necessarily like poisoning it. Uh, Germany had found some fraudulently sweetened wines from Italy in previous years. And so the authorities started testing for known sweeteners. So basically that wine was still safe. It's just that these Italian producers were sweetening the wine and not disclosing it. So they weren't allowed to label it the way they were. And so the regulators started testing for the sweeteners. Okay. I mean, that makes sense. If they're not disclosing the fact that they're using a sweetener, it's dangerous to the public if they don't know. Yeah. And plus like Germany, like if you think France is crazy about the, the types of wines there are, uh, within Pratikots wine itself, which is one subsect of, of Riesling with German wines, mm-hmm. there's like 
seven different steps. Like this, this, this cabinet I'm drinking right now is like the lowest step on that rung. So Germans take their wine classifications extremely seriously. That's wild. You'd think that because of their association with Oktoberfest, it would be beer. I mean, I think all of Europe is just kind of like every, everyone <laughs> in Europe is, is into wine, except maybe Britain a little bit. Yeah, and I mean, we're heathenistic Canadians who don't have a history yeah. rich enough in, like, wine production to say much. Yeah, Alberta has great craft beer, so-so uh, wine production. <laughs> yeah, our wine is kind of, eh. <laughs> our meat is good, though. Meat is a lot more forgiving than wine, though, with brewing, so I don't think mm -hmm. our climate's um, great for wine. I think it also probably helps that, like, we have a lot of meadows and flatlands and grass, grassy areas for bees to like sample from. Yeah, that's what I mean by it's, uh, it's a lot yeah. more forgiving. Uh, like it's not so seasonally dependent. The bees mm -hmm. will produce honey either way and most honey is okay. So uh, the Austrian authorities though had very few wine inspectors. And the, te and the test that they had for known sweeteners didn't turn any results on, on the wine that that been put up from Austria. So to them, it looked like it was all good, but they didn't really have the resources to test everything. <laughs> okay, but what if? Um, okay, you know how like when they do wine tastings, they like sniff the wine first and then they take a sip and then they like say what it tastes like. What if that's what the testers were doing to see about the sweeteners? <laughs> I actually wouldn't be surprised. Like they, they were doing scientific tests, but I actually wouldn't be surprised yeah. if there was a little bit of that going on too, because like Again, the wine industry is <laughs> yeah. weirdly snobbish. Just sniffing the wine, just going, hmm, this smells like sugar. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there, you actually can tell a little bit between, like, I could tell from, um, like, my mead making, the sugars that uh, are still there after you finish fermentation and the sugars you add after the fact do have a little bit different. Like, it's, it's not just the sweetness, it's, like, other flavors and, like, mouthfeel and stuff like that. So oh, wow. I imagine someone who's like an expert would probably would be able to tell. Oh, see, hmm. I just don't have a refined palate, I guess. I mean, me neither, but, you <laughs> know. but this brings us to diethylene glycol. Right. What is diethylene glycol? It and is, freeze. Oh, uh, it's kind of. So it's an organic solvent, a diol, which is somewhat related to alcohol. Uh, alcohol okay. has, has one hydroxyl group, which is just a, just a pairing of oxygen and hydrogen. And a glycol has two hydroxyl groups. So similar to alcohol, different glycols have different toxicity to people. So that's another thing with, with alcohol is that there's actually a whole ton of different types of alcohol. Mm -hmm. Only one is safe for us to drink and only kind of barely. So ethanol is safe for us to drink. Um, if, you've, if you've tried to drink wine right after it's finished brewing, it tastes horrible. And that's because it's got a whole bunch of like other alcohols in it that haven't broken down yet. And those are actually super toxic. They'll give you a hangover, like, immediately, and if you drink enough of them, they'll, like, hurt you. Okay, so, yeah, because, like, a hangover is just basically blood poisoning. Yeah. And so, yeah, no, that makes sense. But this is also, incidentally, why, you, why you're why you not supposed to drink young wine. This is why, like, aged wine is, is the thing. Because the longer mm -hmm. it's aged, the more those out, more of those bad alcohols have broken down and will be out oh, of the okay. wine by the time you drink it. That actually explains a thing that i was always curious about about like why people talk about like the vintages of wine because again going back to like my earlier example of like barefoot moscato that's there it's mass produced there's absolutely no way that it spends like years aging i guarantee it spent at least a year yeah um, but not years uh you know what i'm saying yeah no um mo most wine is actually sold Pretty much a year after it's been produced, but like mm -hmm. high end wines, people will hold on to them for years to let them age more. And if you keep them in the right conditions, it can improve the flavor. Uh, mead is actually greatly helped by this. The longer you can age mead, the better it tastes. But uh, but that's why it's because all those like what they call them, they call them fusel alcohols. They break down into either basic alcohol or they just evaporate into the air and it improves okay. the flavor. Okay. Yeah. No, this all makes sense. So, like, similar to alcohol, glycols have different toxicity to people. Unfortunately, diethylene glycol is one of the worst ones. Uh, this is important because they are metabolized in similar ways. So, diethylene glycol is metabolized similar to alcohol, and mm -hmm. it's also very toxic. Um, uh, diethylene glycol is sweet, and when added to the wine, also gave it more body than straight sugar would. Uh, at the time, no one knew to test for it. So, this would be why no one detected it, because 
the scientific tests didn't really exist yet because, well, they, they existed, but no one was testing wine for it because no one thought that you'd ever find that in wine. It doesn't occur naturally. Okay. And the other thing is that if anyone was drinking it to test it, because diethylene glycol gave it like a, a more full flavor rather than just sweet, and it's not something, again, most people would have ever tasted before, it would probably just come across as like, oh, this is really high quality wine and not like, oh, there's antifreeze in this. Right, because like how how would they have known? Yeah. So articles on the subject uh, refer to diethylene glycol as antifreeze, which is kind of sort of true. It was used like that sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, but ethylene glycol is much more common as antifreeze. Uh, diethylene glycol is actually much more common as ingredients for things like resins, oils, glues, some plastics, that kind of thing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So and it's, yeah, it's like a toxic adhesive almost. Yeah. And then there's also polyethylene glycol, which is a lot safer and is acceptable in some, some quantities in food, but not very much. It's also much more expensive. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've known uh, diethylene glycol has been toxic since at least the 30s, but no one was actually quite sure how toxic until much more recently. Uh, yeah, can... I wonder why. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It can cause cramps, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, uh, over prolonged exposure. It does cause kidney uh, damage or nervous system failure. Yikes. That... Yeah, that just sounds like a nightmare to experience. Yeah, I think in the 30s they were using diethylene glycol as like um, as like the solvent in some of those like elixirs that were being sold at the time, and that's how they found out it was dangerous. Yeah, of course they they were. So, um, I've uh, I've read um, some conflicting accounts of how diethylene glycol contamination, <coughs> sorry, was first suspected. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 Frederick Knudsen's video uh, says an unknown man provided a sample of the glycol to authorities. Uh, other sources said that the fact that farmers were suddenly buying a lot of diethylene glycol is what tipped off authorities. But however it was discovered, uh, Germany started testing and identified contaminated Austrian wine. And then it came out that the Austrian government had already known for at least three months at, uh, prior to the German government figuring this out. Wow, and they didn't do anything about it? Yeah, well, they, they were kind of trying to protect their own wine industry because... Uh, the Austrian like wine control agency was the first group to figure out about the contamination and they mm -hmm. didn't tell like the health and safety bureaus and stuff like that. So, cause they were kind of trying to like solve the problem before it became like, well, uh, widely known, but then Germany figured it out. So they kind of had to admit that they, knew, that they knew. Yeah. But they also should have like halted production and like ceased the export of the wine. Oh, I absolutely agree. They were just trying to like, handle it like under the radar which is a really shitty thing for a health related issue to be handled yeah like i see i fucking hate corporations dude you know this because like this isn't just an industry issue this is like a public health and safety issue because this is a consumable good oh yeah so the austrian government at first tried to downplay the problem insisting there's only a few isolated producers uh huh. They also tried to quietly investigate themselves to avoid a market crash and to avoid tipping off the producers. Now, that is one reason to legit keep it under the radar is if you think it's a small problem and you don't want to tip off the people you're investigating. But as the investigations ramped up, it became clear this was an industry wide problem. This wasn't just this wasn't just a couple of vineyards. This was like a whole bunch of them. And Yikes. Yeah. At first, the testing was really slow. Uh, but new methods were designed that were much faster and could detect much smaller quantities. So at this time, tests for diethylene glycol required quite a lot of it to be present to show up in the test. Mm -hmm. But then uh, then they were devising new methods because they knew they had to test all this stuff. So they were actually starting to actively devise new methods to test it. They managed to get the, the amount that you would need to detect way, way, way down, which let them test a lot more and faster. Okay. So at first, the, the tainted wine producers attempted to dilute their tainted wine with untainted wine, uh, but no one knew which wines were untainted, and the new testing methods rendered, rend, eventually rendered it pointless anyway. Mm -hmm. So it was one of those things where it's like, it's like, it's like if I run a vineyard and I'm doing this this uh, glycol poisoning, and now I'm at risk of being investigated, and it's like, it's like, okay, if I can find a clean source of wine and mix it with my tainted wine, they won't be able to detect it. But the problem is no one knew who else was doing this. Right. So in some cases, like they tried to do this and actually ramped their their ethylene glycol content way up because the other person was doing it worse. 
Jesus Christ. Yeah, because if that person's doing it worse, then, then if I'm doing it, but I'm doing it less, it's not bad. Yeah, so the, the, there's there's lots of this running around, and like the only wines you could pretty much guarantee didn't have this poisoning was the dry wines. But of course, if you mix them with your sweet wines, it's going to make it less sweet, and it'll be pretty obvious you did something. How did they add the diethylene glycol? Was it like added to the soil and this is in the grapes or was oh. it like added after oh no that it was added after so it was okay it, it was added in the same way that like if you were to add sh add sugar or, or a, a sweetening agent after the brewing was done to get the flavor mm -hmm. right it was the same thing that they did just the only they were using ethylene glycol because it wasn't detectable that they knew over the time okay okay and, yeah and uh apparently like the uh, the guy who the chemist who came up with the the, the with the diethylene glycol technique originally had advised a specific amount of diethylene glycol per liter of wine, which was thought to be well under the threshold where it hurt people, and also under the threshold where it would uh, show up on tests. But a lot of the producers weren't following his advice and were just dumping a bunch in, which is part of the reason why this was caught to begin with. Yeah, so like I can. I can see the good intention behind it, but at the same time, like, my dude, you're telling people to add poison to their wine. Yeah. So if they had followed his advice, this could have went on for years, but uh, thankfully, some didn't follow his advice, which got them caught pretty quick. Yeah, one producer, Anton Schmid, attempted to dump his tainted wine in the sewer, but the glycol killed the treatment plant bacteria, resulting in a raw sewage release into, like, waterways. Yeah. So he was caught like right away because obviously authorities are like, why all of a sudden is the sewage plants not treating sewage? And it's like, oh, there's a bunch of glycol in it. So that also told everyone pretty quickly that you can't dump it. Uh, most bottles only had a few grams of diethylene glycol, but there were some that were detected with over 14 grams and as oh high as God. 48 grams were found. Oh my god! <laughs> what are people doing? Yeah, the 48 gram one, someone noted that that if one person had actually drank that whole bottle, they would die. Yeah, you that's poison! You'd fucking kill someone! So, now we know that 0 0.1 gram per liter is enough to be dangerous if you're drinking the wine consistently. And this is Europe, so people, like, I mean, this is just like a preconceived bias that I might have, but like, from what I understand is that People like a glass of wine with their food. Yeah. Like, it's common to have wine with dinner. Yeah. And so, like, you know, the 0 0.1 gram thing, if you drank it, like, once or twice, you'd be fine. But if you were drinking, like, a glass a night, eventually it's start hurting you. Well, yeah, because I imagine it would build up in your system because I don't think your body would be able to break it down fast enough. Yeah. So many countries uh, immediately halted imports of Austrian wine, obviously, and ordered it pulled from the shelves. Mm -hmm. uh, over 27 million liters of the wine had to be destroyed, and it couldn't just be dumped due to the bacterial die-off. Yeah. Also, I read a few articles that said Japan banned Australian wine due to a mistranslation. Oh, no. <laughs> but I couldn't find any original sources for this. Like, I, yeah, I think that that might just be a rumor, because I did study... This is going to sound so stupid. I did study Japanese in high school, and... The names for Austria and Australia are different enough that I don't think a government official would make that mistake. Yeah, and there's the problems with researching this is that almost all the original articles are in German because it's from Austria and Germany. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of mistranslations in the articles at the time because, like, again, this was in the 80s. Like, I'm sure most yeah. places were relying on, like, either a guy they knew who knew some German or, like, trying to like pick through it one word at a time and translate articles so it may it may have been a joke that someone posted at some point and like this is my yeah. speculation that someone made a joke about it and that it turned into a thing because people translating articles didn't re realize that this is supposed to be a joke yeah i can definitely see that especially since like if you're not familiar with the context of a language like tone is something that is so hard to convey when you're learning a different language yeah. So yeah, no, I could definitely see that being a possibility. I could also see just ignorance being a possibility as well. People just being racist and rude. Yeah, it's possible. Uh, the wine was eventually disposed of, though. It was used as coolant in furnaces and concrete plants. 
course it was because it's fucking antifreeze. Yeah. And so, uh, of course, running it in these furnaces managed to burn it off and eventually it was all destroyed. Uh, I mean, good, but still, come on. Many of the producers were charged and served jail time. Mm -hmm. Uh, Many of them had claimed to dieting glycol on their taxes as a business expense, (laughs) which uh, made catching them and proving intent really damn easy. Yeah, that's real. That's really suspicious. Appar- if you've never had it in your production before, and then suddenly it's a business expense. Apparently, there's one vineyard where the, where the owner ha- owned like one small tractor and was ordering like gallons and gallons of stuff every month. And so it's like, yeah, you're not using that in your tractor. What are you talking about? Mm-mm. So uh, about 30 people ended up being sentenced to jail, including Otto Nadrasky. The chemist who had been identified as the origin of the out of the idea, so he's the one who came up with the idea uh, for one of his clients about how to dose their wine with the glycol to make it seem like high quality wine. And yeah, he's the one who made like the original like don't go over this amount, but like as the as the secret got around, people started ignoring that and got them all caught. Yeah, again, I can see the like intent behind it, but my dude. You told them to poison their wine. At the end of the day, if you hadn't told them to do that, they might not have done it. Yeah, like, so it's like, yeah, it sucks your industry colla- would collapse if you didn't do something, but um, you're also poisoning people, so don't do that. Yeah, so yeah, um, I don't really feel that bad for him for having to serve jail time. So, officially, no one is confirmed to have died. Though there were, okay. there were many mysterious sicknesses that were linked to contaminated wine consumption. So, like, there was an uptick in, like, weird gastrointestinal issue, issues, some neurological issues. And then once the wine connection was made, then doctors were able to figure out, oh, this is from, this is diethylene glycol poisoning. Mm-hmm. So, one guy was reported to have died because he grew quite sick, was in intensive care, and I guess had to have, like, part of his, like, uh, intestines removed or something like that from, from dying off. Uh, yeah, poor guy. However, he later appeared in the news to state that he had felt very much alive, actually. <laughs> he was like, hey, don't kill me, please. Yeah, so I guess he, he made a pretty good recovery. And then the news okay, reported he died. Good. And then he was like, he's like, no, like, actually, actually, like, it was bad, but I lived. Well, I mean, I, I feel so bad for him for having to go through that experience. But I am glad that he recovered. Yeah. So how did no one die? Some of the bottles were so contaminated. Well, this is partially because you don't drink tire wa- and bottles of wine yourself. Mm-hmm. So, like, off- often these are being shared socially. Like, the one guy yeah. who one guy who they thought died actually drank a couple bottles to himself while he's on vacation. And it took some home with him. So that's how he managed to consume so much that he was, like, seriously injured by it. Okay. But most of the most of these sicknesses were from, like, groups of people who consumed a bottle or two together, right? Right. But also, one of the antidotes for diethylene glycol poisoning is ethanol, which is regular alcohol. So, well, uh... Yeah. So <laughs> because the fact that diethylene glycol and alcohol are both absorbed the same way by the body, and alcohol is more readily metabolized by the body, uh, if you get mildly drunk on alcohol, then the diethylene glycol can't be metabolized as quickly and will pass through your system without being absorbed. Okay. Which I, a, I, this is news to me. I've never heard of this before. Well, it's because it doesn't happen very often. There's there's uh there's lots of things that can be actually treated with alc- with by getting you drunk. Uh, one is consuming uh, like methanol, like wood alcohols, which are are poisonous. If you get drunk on that, um, and you consume ethanol quick enough after that, it can mitigate some of the effects. Diethylene glycol. There's a few things that like they react the same way as alcohol, but alcohol just absorbs in your system much more fast. So okay. getting you drunk will prevent that stuff from being absorbed. Interesting. I did not know that like drinking alcohol could have any benefits aside from social ones. You know what I mean? Yeah. But uh, there's actually a few treatments that work like this. Like um, people famously know that like when you're exposed to radiation, you're supposed to take like iodine pills and stuff. And the reason why is because from radioactive fallout, there's, there's a, a radioactive isotope of iodine. And if you absorb enough uh, radioactive iodine from the environment, it can get into your thyroid and cause thyroid cancer. Oh, okay. So by taking uh, high-dose tablets of known clean iodine, 
then you saturate your thyroid with good iodine, which prevents the radioactive iodine from being absorbed, and it'll just pass through your system without being absorbed into your thyroid. So That's there, so wild. There's lots of treatments that work like that, where you take one thing just because your body picks it up quicker than the other thing. The, I mean, to me, this just sounds like, hey, I know you were poisoned, so just take this other poison yeah, that's less bad for you yeah pretty much but because the wine contained alcohol too usually in fairly high quantities yeah like, like the one i have here is 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 nine percent which is pretty low for for uh uh baby cat's wine mm -hmm. or predicats wine yeah uh it's but you know that, that's a pretty low alcohol content for that so the alcohol content being high enough is probably what kept a lot of these people from getting sick because the alcohol was preventing the diethylene glycol from absorbing into their system that's that's so wild. But uh, this prevents actually a bigger problem because some brands of non-alcoholic grape juice were also found to be contaminated. Oh no! They, they they were found in in much lower levels in the wine, so it's so they probably weren't adding the diethylene glycol to the grape juice on purpose. It was probably getting cross contaminated with their wine production. Right, because as we said earlier, you can add grape juice to wine. Yeah, so so I'm going to guess it's one of those situations where they were storing stuff in the same containers mm -hmm. and it was cross-contaminated and like I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt here and say they weren't trying to put it in grape juice. I I doubt that the uh grape juice industry is as extreme as the wine industry. Well, a lot of it's be coming from the same place, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it makes sense if you're making wine, why not also make grape juice? Also, thankfully, no deaths were reported. I don't think any serious injuries were reported either. They just It's just something that they noted that like when they tested some of the grape juice from these producers, it had to be pulled too because it had some diethylene glycol in it. Mm -hmm. But wait, there's more. Oh, God. <laughs> so some of the German brands of wine were also found to be contaminated, but at much lower doses. Uh, at first, oh, good. <laughs> yeah. At first, the German producers tried to blame cross-contamination in the bottling process. Uh-huh. But, and this is funny because they because the German producers were not putting diethylene glycol in their wine. That was true. But what was found is that some German producers were secretly buying up cheaper Austrian wine to mix in with their own wine to boost their own output. Of course they were. So so in, if they didn't have an, enough to meet their quota for the year, they would just buy some cheaper Austrian wine, mix in with theirs, and and distribute it as if nothing was wrong. So that resulted in, in them unintentionally tainting their own wine man the, the fucking wine industry is so shady what the hell but it's it's not all bad news because as a result of this wine regulations worldwide but a especially in austria and germany were strictly increased uh, good this actually ended up improving the industry considerably so austrian wine is is now amongst one of the most strictly quality controlled in the world uh, also they became much more well known for their dry wines <laughs> which, which wouldn't have been part of the scandal, which, is, yeah. But I think it's also easier for them to grow the grapes for the dry wines, right? Because you don't have to worry too much about the sugar content of the grapes. Yeah, because I, when I was looking up the the wine to drink for this episode, I could not find an Austrian Pradikatz wine in any stores here, which kind of makes sense because if now their biggest export is 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 dry wines instead of sweet wines, mm -hmm. and. We're in Canada. Yeah, it, it makes I sense really doubt. Be, like, I'd probably have to go to a specialty wine store to get something like that. Yeah, I was just thinking specialty wine store or like specifically an Austrian import store that also carries alcohol. And also at your typical neighborhood liquor store around here, you're going to find a lot more sweet wines than you will dry wines just because of the fact that like we basic. Because of basic bitches like me. Woo! And me. I, I'm... <laughs> I, I, I I like wine, but I'm a bit of weenie too. I just it's so bitter. I don't like it. I did have uh well, actually we had a, we had a guest recently. One of my dad's friends brought a, a bottle of red wine that uh, was from South Africa of all places. Mm -hmm. And I don't normally like red wines, but it was really good. So I need to go figure out what it was to buy more of it. Was it like a sweet wine? No, it wasn't sweet. Oh, huh, interesting. Cause I I. Again, I'm a wine dumbass, but like my understanding is that red wine is less sweet than white wine. 
Not necessarily. Like, uh, there are more sweet white wines than red wines. You can have a red wine that's sweet. Uh, you can mm. also have an orange wine, which is where you make a white wine using a red wine process, which is a thing that I can't wrap my head around. Oh my god, that sounds amazing. <laughs> but, but the thing that uh, puts people off about red wine is that red wine has a lot of what's called tannin, which is that like oh yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, that that taste that kind of punches you in the tongue and makes you pucker up a little bit. Yeah. So I'm not normally a big fan of tannin, and so I don't normally like red wines. But this one was actually quite pleasant, even with the tannin. So it was quite nice. Oh, well, maybe maybe if you find it, uh, share some with me. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. So that was the Austrian wine scandal. I am glad that no one died or, as far as we know, was seriously injured. But, like, come on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it's definitely, like, I can see how this happened because of the contracts. And this this, yeah. this also shows the danger in... Making contra- making long term contracts on something that like you have little control over, like the weather. Yeah. Which uh, is becoming increasingly relevant, unfortunately. <laughs> looks at food production. Looks at government. Hmm. Looks at wine production. What new chemical <laughs> are you gonna find to put in here? Oh God! Don't get any dumb ideas, guys. We've already been down this road once before. Just do normal food science to it. Get rid of your inhibitions of, like, just doing science to the wine. Just let people add sugar to their wine. Just, I'm just picturing, like, someone with a coffee mug with, like, wine in it, and they're just, like, putting tablespoons of sugar in, like, they're making wine <laughs> coffee. That would be me. Do you, do you take two cubes with your wine or three? Honestly, though, that would be me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, if you, dear listener, have any crime suggestions for us, any stories that you'd like us to cover on the Let's Do a Crime podcast, we have an email address where you can send those suggestions at let's do a crime at gmail.com. That's L E T S D O A C R I M E at gmail.com. Until next time, don't drink antifreeze. Yeah, don't poison people, especially in something that they should be enjoying with their food. Alcohol's already poisonous enough. (laughs) Okay, bye. Bye.